Tom Kunstman. I'm professor of chemistry and dean of the School of Natural Sciences. This is our final natural science seminar of the semester. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Right, end of the year. That's correct. Not the academic year. Probably. Yeah, of course. Uh, we've got a special treat today. We have uh, alumni Jonathan Hall, who graduated in 2015. Is that right? 2016. 2016. Okay, 2016. Uh, while he was here, he played on the tennis team for three years, three years. He, uh, uh, his undergraduate thesis, he worked on the chemistry of uh, batteries, and he's now at the University of Chicago as a PhD student in, I'll have you tell folks, cell and molecular biology. And molecular biology. So let's have a warm welcome to John. And Too. Yes, yeah. Uh, everybody. His parents and his grandparents. Oh. Grandparents taught here for 49 years. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Too loud? Too loud? Okay. Uh, I want to start just by uh, thanking you for having me. It's really great to be back and uh, it's special for me to be here because it was just a few years ago when I was a student myself sitting in the audience at these seminars. Uh, today, I'm excited to share a bit about my journey in science with you. Then I hope to convince you that the cell is a world dominated by the actions of non-coding RNAs. And then uh, I'll share a short story from my own research that I work on at the University of Chicago. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so to begin, my scientific journey started at Rockford High School. This is just north of Grand Rapids, and I took an AP chemistry class. When I thought about what I wanted to study at college, I was actually thinking, you know, maybe Spanish, global studies, something along those lines. And reflecting over my senior year, I realized just how much fun I had in the science lab. And that's evidenced here by the, the smoles that our teacher let us make in the lab on Wool Day. <laughs> um, so I felt like I owed it to myself to uh, give science a chance, and I came to Spring Arbor and took organic chemistry <coughs> in my first semester at SAU. And this confirmed it for me that I just really loved being in the lab. Dr. Baldwin designed some great lab experiments, and when I took the course at the end, we uh, started it out on a small research project. So the idea that I could discover something new about the world was just so exciting and thrilling to me, and it really got me hooked on research. I love being in the lab so much so that I volunteered to do Cougar Science Camp and TA as often as I could. This is a photo of my wife Paige and our sheepadoodle puppy Bella on the shore of Lake Michigan in Chicago. Uh, Paige was also a student at Spring Arbor, and I met her at science camp volunteering. Uh, she, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she wishes that she could be here today, um, but she's currently doing a pediatric cardiovascular surgery for physician assistant school. Uh, so if you're interested in PA uh, as a profession, I'd be happy to connect you with her. Um, so I actually wanted to get some summer research experience and applied to Van Andel Research Institute to work the summer after my freshman year, and I was denied. Uh, but I felt like going through the application process really helped put into perspective the kinds of things that I should be thinking about and learning and focusing on. So the next round, I applied and was accepted to an NSF REU program. That's the National Science Foundation, funds these programs called Research Experience for Undergraduates. And I worked in Kevin Walker's lab uh, doing some biochemistry. These programs are really great because they connect you to peers that are also very interested in research. And I learned a ton of just foundational skills in biochemistry. And uh, I really, it cemented that I love doing research. And I learned I love biology too. So I came back to Spring Arbor, added a biology major, and did a second RE program at the University of Michigan with Ron Woodard. I worked on some microbiology, and then while I was at Spring Arbor, I worked with Tom Kunselman on a chemistry honors thesis project. 
So altogether, these research experiences provided a strong foundation for me for uh, this next step in research and confirmed that graduate school is what I wanted to do. So I applied and was accepted to the University of Chicago, the Molecular Biosciences Cluster, from which we have five graduate programs, the Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics program, my program, which is the Cell and Molecular Biology program. We've got Development, Regeneration, Stem Cell Biology, Genetics, Genomics, and Systems Biology, and Human Genetics. Uh, to give you a taste for what being a student is like in my program, the first year, our university flies out all of the incoming students in the biological sciences to the Marine Biological Laboratory, or MBL, which is really cool. Uh, we get to participate in what's called a quantitative biology boot camp, and the overall goal is to give us um, exposure to methods in quantitative biology and just general socialization so we can make connections that will hopefully last throughout our time in graduate school. When we come back, we start coursework and can rotate in labs that we're interested in doing our thesis research in. Uh, at the end of our first year, we take a preliminary exam, which is a defense of a written research proposal. Then we can join a lab, and the second year we form a thesis committee, defend the proposal of what we actually want to do in our qualifying exam. And now uh, I'm on this step, which is just doing your thesis research. Okay. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the um, organizations I became involved in at the University of Chicago. The first is I'm a founding member of GRIT, the Graduate Recruitment Initiative Team. And uh, the goal of GRIT, it's a student-run organization that's focused on improving uh, recruitment and retention of students that are underrepresented in science and our graduate programs. And one of the things that we advocated for was the removal of the GRE from our admissions process. I don't want to get into this too much, but in short, uh, the GRE fails to predict um, uh, metrics of graduate student success, like time to graduation, number, quality of publications, um, and then the cost and format of the GRE is pretty heavily biased, and uh, I think faculty really appreciated that the less time students are wasting studying for the GRE is more time that they could be doing more important things like uh, working in the lab. <laughs> So um, I also got involved with SACNIS, the Society for Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And through this, um, I was able to attend a national meeting and present my work. Uh, I think this is uh, a really great organization for making connections, and also it's focused on um, improving diversity and inclusion and stuff. OK. Um, so at the end of my first year, and this is kind of when Paige also started uh, PA school, uh, Paige applied to all of the uh, programs in the Chicago area and was accepted to all of them. So I just want to brag about her that <laughs> she chose Northwestern University. And uh, that's her email. So again, if this is something you're interested in, I'd be happy to connect you with her. Um, and I joined uh, this guy, this lab, Alex Ruthenberg, to do a molecular biology PhD thesis. Okay. So, what is molecular biology? Uh, it's kind of a broad term, but I would say that anyone who studies something related to the central dogma of molecular biology is a molecular biologist. And so this concept is so important that I'm going to actually copy it onto the board here so that you can reference it throughout the rest of my talk. Um, so. In short, uh, DNA. Is transcribed. Into RNA. And I'm going to add a step here and that in that first step of transcription, there's actually pieces of the RNA molecule that contain nonsense information, and they're called introns, that need to be removed. So that removal of the introns is called splicing. 
sort of produce a mature messenger RNA. So we use M for message. And then this is translated into proteins that do work for the cell. Okay, so again, to reiterate, it's DNA contains the blueprint in our cells, which is transcribed into RNA. RNA needs to be processed to remove the introns, which contain nonsense information, to get a mature messenger RNA, and then this is translated into proteins that do work for the cell. Okay. Uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page with what RNA is, I have a cartoon of RNA on the left and DNA on the right. Uh, you can see that DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, contains our genetic information and has these uh, nucleobases that pair with each other to form two strands coming together, a double-stranded DNA molecule. RNA uh, can be double-stranded, but it's depicted here as single-stranded, also has bases, so it's kind of like a cousin to DNA. And why do people study the central dogma, and why is this important? And why, uh, what makes a neuron different from a skin cell? A neuron needs to be, um, or a neuron uh, doesn't hardly ever divide, but a skin cell needs to be constantly dividing to replace itself, right? So they perform fundamentally different functions for the body, and yet they have the same DNA. And so the reason the central dogma is important is that there are steps that regulate the transcription of RNAs and the translation of proteins to produce different molecules in the cells. Okay. Uh, and for a long time, we thought of RNA in this way as an intermediate from the DNA information to the proteins that do work for the cell. But what we've come to appreciate more recently is that RNA is more than an intermediate, and RNA actually works to regulate each of these processes and do, it does a whole bunch of other crazy cool things for the cell. Uh, we've come to appreciate this in part due to a major revolution in sequencing technologies. The sequencing technologies identify all of the DNA or RNA that were present in a sample of cells. So uh, when we first started sequencing things, the cost to sequence a human genome was millions of dollars. And we actually hit the point in 2017 where the cost to sequence a human genome was less than $1,000, which is just mind-blowing to me. Um, and as a result of this, uh, we've, scientists have started to sequence more and more things, and we've generated a plethora of sequencing data. What we've started to learn from this is that in our genome, less than 5% of our genome actually codes for proteins. And that over 70% of our genome is transcribed, and most of this is non-coding RNAs, which could be short or long. And what are non-coding RNAs, since we make so many of them and many types of species of them? Uh, by definition, it's an RNA molecule that gets transcribed but it doesn't code for proteins. It ultimately is not translated. Uh, you might think of like tRNA, which carries the charged amino acid to the ribosome to facilitate translation as an example of this. Ribosomal RNA is also an example of a non-coding RNA. Um, and there's even more. And what can they do? Uh, well, first, one property of RNA is that it can be catalytic. So RNA can catalyze enzymatic reactions. On the right, I'm showing the splicing reaction that I talked about here in Central Dogma. Splicing starts with a newly synthesized RNA molecule that has nonsense information in the introns. And these exons have the coding sequence information. So the intron needs to be spliced out. So splicing cuts out the intron and joins together the exons, so you have a mature messenger RNA. And I spoke of uh, revolutions in technology. In structural biology, there's been a major revolution, and that's called cryogenic electron microscopy, which allows us to see structures like this 
that are large complexes of molecules at a level of detail we've never been able to see before. And so what I love about the structure of the spliceosome, which catalyzes the splicing reaction, is that the protein part of the structure is faded into the background and brought to our attention is the non-coding RNAs that are part of this structure. And indeed, those non-coding RNAs are essential for splicing to happen. So the center of catalysis is where the five prime exon in red is joined to this blue three prime exon. And you can see the U5 non-coding RNA, the U6 non-coding RNA, and the U2 non-coding RNA are all in close proximity to the center of catalysis. And the other thing that's cool about the structure is you can see the U2 non-coding RNA recognizes through base pairing interactions with this purple intron. And so non-coding RNAs are important for the fidelity of splicing by recognizing where on the RNA we need to cut. And they're critical for actually doing the, the cut and joining together the RNA molecule. OK. Uh, RNA can also bind to proteins. So I'm using the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing system as an example of this. Uh, here we have genomic DNA, which is melted. So there's the two strands of DNA are separated here. And what's bound to this DNA is the Cas9 nuclease and the single guide RNA. The single guide RNA and the Cas9 nuclease together are the CRISPR-Cas9 system that's what's responsible for editing the genome and making a cut in the DNA to change the sequence, for example. And so without the RNA, this, this system won't work. Uh, the guide RNA forms this cool structure that gets recognized by the Cas9 protein, and they bind and associate together. Um, proteins uh, bind to RNA, or RNA binds to proteins. Uh, for a number of purposes, including recruitment of proteins to particular locations in the cell. Uh, RNA can scaffold together and glue together multiple proteins. And RNA can stimulate enzymic, enzymatic activity of a protein. Also what's shown in this structure is that RNA here can base pair with DNA and bind to DNA. And that's pretty intuitive because RNA has you know, the same bases almost as DNA. But what's not so much intuitive is that RNA can actually bind to double-stranded DNA as well. So on the left is a DNA duplex where you have two strands of the nucleic acid. I'm highlighting where the major groove is here. And on the right, you can see these two strands of DNA in this greenish color, the major groove, where the RNA molecule sits in really nicely. And so this forms a triplex, uh, which is new and interesting and cool um, biochemistry that people are working on understanding in more detail. Uh, RNA can also base pair with other RNAs. In this cartoon example, microRNAs, which are small, can base pair with a messenger RNA and block translation from happening. So this is an example where a non-coding RNA regulates which proteins are made in the cell. And the last, the last example of this is uh, telomeres, uh, that RNA can be a template for new DNA synthesis. So telomeres are these uh, pieces of DNA at the end of our chromosomes. And it's a repeat of the same sequence over and over and over again. As we age and as cells divide, the telomeres begin to shorten. And so the reason we have telomeres in the first place is to protect the genetic material, the DNA and genes that are in the middle of our chromosomes from degradation. So to replenish the end of the telomere, to add more repeats to the end of the telomere, we have a RNA protein machine that uses RNA to base pair to the end of our chromosomes. And then there's this sequence of RNA left unpaired that gets used as a template for new DNA synthesis. And so uh, just to summarize the properties of RNA that I've shared with you so far are that RNA can catalyze reactions, can bind to proteins, RNA can bind to DNA in multiple forms, 
and RNA can bind other RNAs, and then last, RNA can be a template for creating new DNA. Okay. So, the, the key takeaway here is that non-coding RNAs can use these properties to perform a multitude of functions for the cell. And that's what this image from a review article is showing, is a few examples of functions for non-coding RNAs in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm of the cell. And so the cell truly is a non-coding RNA world. Uh, even more so, uh, what we've started to learn, uh, you know, I spoke of sequencing technologies, is that disease-associated mutations are frequently found in the non-coding regions of our genome. And therefore, I would argue that in order to understand disease and just how a cell works, we need to have a better understanding of our non-coding DNA and the non-coding RNAs that are transcribed from that DNA. Okay. So that brings us to a story about my research in the Ruthenberg lab. How are we doing? Let's see. My heart's beating, so that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually study kind of in a way how the hearts how our hearts beat, right? So on average, our hearts beat over two billion times in our life. And if you think about it, every cell needs to contract and expand at, precise, at precisely the right moment in order, in order to ensure a robust cardiac rhythm, right? And so that process, we think, must be tightly controlled and regulated, and our hypothesis is that non-coding RNAs might play a role in this. So the two questions of my research are that, one, uh, what are the non-coding RNAs, if any, that affect heart development and or rhythm? And then two, how do those non-coding RNAs actually do that? Okay, so to start out as a starting place, we know of this transcription factor, which is a protein that binds to DNA, called TBX5. And TBX5 controls heart development and rhythm. Mutations in TBX5 will cause atrial septal defects, which is one of congenital heart disease. And in a mature, fully developed heart tissue, if you remove TGX5 function, this will cause atrial fibrillation and irregular heartbeats. What we also know is that TGX5 binds to non-coding DNA in addition to gene promoters. And TGX5 will initiate transcription from both locations uh, at the gene promoter to affect the amount of RNAs that are transcribed from the gene and ultimately translated to proteins. But it will also bind to non-coding DNA and initiate transcription there to make non-coding RNAs. So we thought that, and our collaborators agreed, that these non-coding RNAs might be important for regulating heart rhythm and development. So we set out to identify these. and. This is an experiment done by our collaborators where they worked with mice and dissected mice, just regular wild-type mice, to get atrial tissues from the heart. Then they kind of mashed up that tissue to extract total RNA and used what's called a poly-A depletion to separate this into two pools of RNA, a pool of RNA enriched for poly-A tails and a pool of RNA depleted for poly-A tails. You might be thinking, what's a poly-A tail? A poly-A tail is part of the processing for an mRNA. It gets added to the end of an mRNA. And non-coding RNAs, although sometimes have poly-A tails, are often uh, without them. So we thought that this pool of RNAs would be enriched for non-coding <coughs> RNAs, and we'd see more non-coding RNAs in our sequencing data if we sequence these pool. Okay. Uh, we can do the same experiment, except this time we can knock out the transcription factor TBX5. And then by comparing this pool of non-coding RNAs that are poly -A depleted to this pool, we can get a sense for the non-coding RNAs that require TBX5 for their transcription. So a TBX5 dependent non-coding RNA, we'd expect to be transcribed and present here, but greatly reduced or maybe even absent in this pool of RNA. Right? 
Okay. Uh, and so mice are great, uh, but they're kind of smelly, and they're expensive, and they can take a long time to do an experiment with. And they bite. And they, they might bite you. <laughs> So uh, this is where uh, cell culture is a very powerful tool for asking and answering a lot of questions in molecular biology. And that's what I do, is I grow <coughs> mouse heart cells in a little tissue culture flask uh, with some nutrient-rich media. And what's amazing about this is that spontaneously, over time, these cells will start to beat. So if you look at these cells under the microscope, this is what you would see. It's a layer of cardiomyocytes, or heart cells. And here they are. They're beating. Wow. And it's, yeah. So this really just blew my mind when I first saw it. You know, I was so excited, and it just hooked me. I was like, oh, I want to do something really into heart <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so this, this system is a really good model for how a heart <laughs> tissue works, right? So uh, my lab studies gene transcription, and we wanted to know, OK, these TBX5-dependent non-coding RNAs, since they require TBX5, they're already likely to maybe be involved in heart development and heart rhythm. But are any of these affecting gene transcription? We know that transcription happens on a chromatin template, right? So our DNA is wrapped around histone proteins, and that forms a nucleosome, which is part of the chromatin. And then chromatin makes up the larger chromosome, right? And we have uh, many chromosomes in our cells. Uh, transcription happens at this level on the chromatin <coughs> template. So we reasoned, our hypothesis was that uh, the non-coding RNAs that are uh, tightly associated with or interacting with chromatin may be more likely to be affecting gene transcription. Okay? And so then, this is where we turned to a fractionation approach to identify those exact non-coding RNAs that are interacting with chromatin in heart cells. So I grew these heart cells, they're mouse heart cells, and we can isolate their nuclei, which has the chromatin, RNA is associated with those with that chromatin and then the nucleoplasm. And then we can use a high salt uh, urea containing detergent buffer, which is used to extract the nucleoplasm from the nucleus. And what this buffer does is it makes the nuclear membrane a bit more permeable, and the high salt pushes out the, uh, the nucleoplasm. Um, outside of the nucleus, and the soluble RNAs are washed away. Then since the nucleus and the chromatin are heavy, we can spin down our sample, and in the pellet of a tube will be the chromatin fraction, and the chromatin-enriched or associated RNAs, and on top of that in liquid form is the nucleoplasm. So after we've separated our fractions, then we can submit each fraction for RNA sequencing to identify all of the RNAs that were present in our samples. And through this, uh, we look at which ones were chromatin enriched, or what we call CHE RNAs. So I intersected my data from this experiment with our data from the TBX5 dependent non coding RNA sequencing. And we found over 300. RNAs that are non-coding, they require TBX5 for their transcription, and they're enriched in the chromatin fraction. So I then further developed an algorithm to narrow down this list to a group of about 10 J RNAs that I think are very exciting and likely to be involved in regulating heart rhythm and maybe development too. And I wanted to test one of them. So I asked this question, you know, if we destroy the CHE RNA completely, what happens to the nearby gene transcription? Will this be affected? So I used a method called knockdown to reduce the CHE RNA. And I did that in a group of cells where I treated with the reagent that will destroy the non-coding RNA, and a group of cells that got a control just like water, right? And so by comparing those two treatments, uh, I can get a full change over control. So if there's no change, 
then we'll see the um, RNA be at a level of one. But if there is reduction, it will be less than one. And if it goes up, it'll be greater than one, right? It's a full change. So for two control RNAs, there's really no difference. But when I look at the CHE RNA, indeed, I'm able to reduce its level by about 50%. And looking at the nearby gene, this is also reduced, which was very exciting to me, because this suggests that the CHE RNA, indeed, is acting to help increase the nearby gene transcription. And I confirm this with a second, completely separate experiment using a different knockdown method to reduce the CHE RNA and then look at the effect on the nearby gene. And so uh, what we conclude from this is that there is you know, one of those 10 that I've looked at so far, uh, one of those 10 candidates does activate nearby gene transcription in heart cells. And so getting back to my first research question, uh, we've really started to pin this down and answer this, that there's over 300 uh, non-coding RNAs that are likely to help ensure a robust heart rhythm. And one of them uh, acts to increase nearby gene transcription. Well, that doesn't really get at how, and I'm still working on that. Uh, but let me share with you a model for how we think this might be happening. So our model is that first, TBX5 will bind to non-coding DNA to initiate and drive transcription of the CHE RNA. Then this CHE RNA will interact with the gene promoter to facilitate what's called a loop. And so this loop brings the activating factors at the non-coding RNA into close proximity to the gene promoter. And so since activation is brought to the gene promoter, this drives increased transcription at the gene and produces more mRNAs. These mRNAs then get translated into proteins, and those proteins can do work for the cell, like helping to ensure heart rhythm. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all. I have to thank my uh, lab, especially uh, Mike, Lindsay, and Charlotte. Uh, the Moskowitz lab, Holly and Raj, were the two uh, people that worked on the TBX5 dependent non-coding RNA sequencing experiment. I have to thank my thesis committee, Kathy for organizing this, and uh, Dr. K for his continued mentorship and support and the Spring Arbor Natural Sciences Division. Thank you. Take some questions. Yeah? Two students first. Okay. What was the lab that you went to, like the marine bio lab? The marine biological laboratory? Yeah. So this is uh, kind of by like Cape Cod um, in Massachusetts. Okay. And uh, it's a place where there's a number of researchers that work full time studying marine biology. Mm -hmm. And also they host workshops and do courses uh, for students to, to teach them about a number of things science that are marine biology related or just biology related. The University of Chicago has kind of partnered with them. Yeah. Is not including what they used to call junk DNA? Yes, yeah. For a long time, right? Long time. People called the non coding genome just junk. And that model has kind of been refuted, and recently we've started to appreciate in probably the last five to ten years that there's a lot of important stuff happening in the non-coding genome, and those non-coding RNAs made from, from the non-coding genome are important for a lot of biology. But we have no idea what a lot of them do, right? We know that they exist, and we've identified a ton of these non-coding RNAs, but what do they do? We really only know a handful of cases. So that's a case where we assume that um, the DNA were doing only one thing, yeah. which is coding. Yeah. So now we may discover a, a nicer term for non-coding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. So for the introns, is that right? The yep. Introns. Sense ones. How? 
how does splicing like how does it know to splice that out in particular? There are sequences at the five prime, so on the left side, and the, the three prime side that kind of distinguish where the, the intron is on the RNA, and the splicing uh, machinery recognizes those sequences, and uh, that kind of helps tell it where to, to cut and join together the, the axons. And does that like require energy for that to take place? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what happens to the introns that do get spliced and they get recycled? Back? A lot of times they're degraded, yeah. And so then they become just free um, uh, individual RNAs. Yeah, but they're degraded. Sometimes they could do things, though. And people have started to study that, too. Because those are a form of non-coding RNAs because the intron actually doesn't get translated. Right. Dr. Ravitch, yeah. So the dissections of the heart, that was atria, or that was just right atria, that was just left atria, what? It's just the right atria, yeah. Okay, so you're looking at nodal tissue then? Yeah, yeah. All right. We also have the left atria, I believe, yeah. Yeah. and they're looking at the ventricles too, so. Okay, yeah. since the heart has other tissues that are expressed in a side, to left, left, right, asymmetric fashion, hand one, hand two, those sorts of things. Do those regulate non coding RNAs as well? Hand one, hand two? Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep, they do. And there's some actually uh, really great work. Um, Eric Olson's lab and a few others have looked at some antisense non coding RNAs that are. Um, if you have a gene transcribed in this direction, uh, there can be transcription in the opposite direction. It produces a non-coding transcript, and that can in turn regulate the gene and other other things. And so, uh, at the hand of two locus, there is an antisense non-coding RNA that's been studied. Yeah. And that's expressed in a side specific fashion as well. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. And do you know anything about the chain RNA expression on the on the other side then? The expression of the chair is uh, not yet um, on the ventricles. Um, I do know, so we we can another. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, no. That being that being important control, it seems to me. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be good to look at that. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully I'll get a handle on that data soon. Yeah. Yeah. This is a question based on abject ignorance. Okay. So if uh, this whole sequence wants to create a certain protein. Yep. Yeah. And I, I assume that kind of starts up at the DNA transcription uh -huh. and, and the splicing, uh, the actual transcription of the splicing varies depending on what protein is going to be produced. Yes. So if, are there situations where you have uh, the initial RNA that looks the same yep. for different proteins, and it's the splicing that determines what the protein gets produced? Yes, yes, indeed. There's uh, Splicing can happen in a number of ways for a lot of genes, and those variations and splicing patterns contribute to a great uh, diversity of, of potential proteins that are made in the cells. Yep. And there's diseases where, you know, like musculoskeletal diseases where a defect in splicing that produces a certain isoform, is what it's called, of uh, RNA can cause disease. And so people study that and it's, yeah, it's really cool. Can there also be uh, choices, if you will, to be made uh, when you have the message RNA? Yes, yeah, so you can get to this uh, messenger RNA level and still there are mechanisms in the cell to control how much of it and which ones are translated into proteins, yeah, including like microRNAs. Okay. Oh, we got one more right here. Yeah. So you said your um, wife was going to looking at going to the party about the surgery. 
She's working on that right now for a rotation for PA school. Yes. Uh, did either of you like inspire each other to go into your field of interest, or did that just happen to be a coincidence? Just kind of happened to be a coincidence, I guess. Yeah. 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 I actually kind of started with my interest in non-coding RNAs in general, and then you know came into this heart project that was really cool. And uh, Paige just loved the heart unit. Yeah. But now it's cool because we can talk about heart biology together a bit. So <laughs> it's kind of nice to not talk about science all the time, but it's also great that we can understand each other a little bit. <laughs> uh, question in the back, yeah. Yeah, way in the back. Since you almost completed a math major here, sure. when you're done with this research, I think you ought to write a connection between all of this and some group theory. Okay. Okay. So keep that in mind, but don't do it until you're all done. Okay. But I could see that to be a great publishable uh, item. Only, Thank only you. if you advise me. For <laughs> <laughs> those of you who might not know what's going on there, it's just talking to his grandpa who taught Matthew for 49 years. <laughs> Let's have a hand for John.